My name is Elizabeth Lund, and this is Poetry in Motion, where writers make the language move. Today our guest is Kathleen Aguero, a poet and professor at Pine Manor College who uses poetry as a tool to help women discover their power and potential. Kathleen has done this subtly in her writing, which explores various aspects of women's lives. In the classroom, Kathleen is more direct, showing her students how literature can expand their understanding of the world and form a bridge between various groups. These concepts are liberating, Kathleen says, whether she's teaching a college class or leading a discussion at Changing Lives Through Literature, an alternative sentencing program. In both arenas, Kathleen's sensitivity and skillful use of language leave a lasting impact. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, the Massachusetts Review, and the Cincinnati Review. She has published three books of poems and a chapbook titled Investigations, The Mystery of the Girl Sleuth. Kathleen has also edited three volumes of multicultural literature and has been a recipient of grants from the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and the Elgin Cox Foundation. She has also been a fellow at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and a visiting research associate at the Brandeis University Women's Studies Research Center. Kathleen, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for having me, Elizabeth. Would you open with a poem? Sure. I think I'll read a poem from Investigations, The Mystery of the Girl Sleuth, which is the new chapbook out with Gervaina Barva. And these poems are all about Nancy Drew, imagining myself into her lives in various ways. Competence. Nancy's sick of being competent. But she can't quit because someone made her up and she still earns the money. A hundred crime victims whimper like strays in a pound. Mystery after mystery, formula plots Nancy can solve in white gloves and a hat. That one sold so well and they write her into another. Just about now she'd like to change plots, but she can't figure out how to trade in her roadster for a bucking bronco or a truck with a rifle underneath the front seat. She'd like to strip off her clothes as slowly as daybreak in winter and tease some crook into her bed. She has transferable skills, but doesn't know how to describe them. Sometimes she thinks she'd rather serve coffee in the local diner, slap a wet rag across table so it smudges more than it wipes off. She'd listen to people's troubles without having to solve them. Maybe things would be different in a bigger city, Paris or Rio, or on a farm so remote only she ate the vegetables grown there. Or just once, could she be the one to get rescued? Nancy sighs, opens her mail. It's the author again. Next victim, missing heiress. First clue, empty locket. Same wardrobe, same car. Mm. That's a great poem. Thank and you. When you were reading it, I kept thinking, oh, how fascinating. Nancy is in a situation that she did not create, but she has to deal with it. Right. And she has to find a way to rise to everybody's expectations. In many ways, that's what a lot of women mm -hmm. around the world do every day. Is that one of the reasons you chose to write about Nancy? Yeah, I mean, Nancy Drew was a very important figure for me when I was a child. And as I approached middle age, I kind of thought, where is she now when I really need her? Mm -hmm. And I began, I teach children's literature thinking about these books. And it became a way for me to um, interrogate women's lives. Um, Imagine what Nancy Drew would be like if she'd ever gotten older than, I don't know how old she is, 17 or 20. And also look back at the books for their, their biases. And in this poem, I was thinking the way women, maybe men too, the, being competent is a sort of double-edged sword because mm -hmm. the more you can do, the more you're asked to do. And at some point, I think people get tired of it and wish they could be one of those people who just lets others mop up after them. Mm -hmm. And you said two interesting things. Actually, your entire <laughs> response was fascinating. But I was really curious when you said that I need her now. Mm. And then you also said that she allowed you to interrogate women's lives. What did you mean by those comments? Well, what do I mean by I need her now? Um, 
You know, when I was a kid, reading Nancy Drew, she, she had everything, the car, you know, the father, no mother, um, and she could solve every problem. And I guess I felt at a certain point in my life that, I, you know, I didn't quite have a grip on everything, and I wish I could read a Nancy Drew book in which she solved the kinds of problems that we really face. Mm -hmm. And interrogating women's lives, what did I mean by that? I think she was a key figure to a lot of women. And we can understand why, her independence, you know, her success. Um, and looking back at the figure and trying to think about what made her so attractive was a way for me to think about what we all hoped for, um, what we were finally able to achieve, and also in some ways how unrealistic her life was. Mm -hmm. You know, she, was a, uh, she had incredible privilege. And there's a lot of amazing class bias in those books. All the crooks are swarthy, you know, all the victims are, you know, impoverished gentlewomen. Mm -hmm. And although it was a very inspiring image in some ways, it was not a good fit, I think, for most of our lives. Mm -hmm. Do you find that your students at Pine Manor College also feel that they should have it all or that they need to meet some expectations that can't possibly be met. Yeah, sure. I mean, in some ways, they're very realistic. They're not, the, the women at Pine Manor are not particularly privileged. Um, it's a very diverse college, and also we draw on a very urban population. Um, some of the women might be second or third generation college students, but many are the first to go to college. So in some ways, you know, they're much more career focused than I was. I wanted to be a poet. On the other hand, I remember a student telling me she would like to have um, be a college professor, and you know, I think she said she wanted to earn eighty thousand dollars a year. And I said, well, gee, none of us earn that here. And she mm. changed her major. Or other students mm. who somehow had the idea that you know, I we all of us appeared in the classroom mm -hmm. and then went home and wrote poetry or did whatever we did, and they just didn't have a realistic sense of what it means even to be a teacher and prepare classes and grade papers and interact. And so I think it's a funny combination of um, wanting a lot, like wanting a lot of commercial things, of material things, but also being really, uh, these young women, in touch with the hard lives that many people have. Mm. Do they have their own version of Nancy Drew, do you think, or do they need one? Um, I don't know if they have one. I think that Nancy, maybe Nancy Drew has been updated. I don't know when the latest versions are, but it's really interesting to read the original versions and then read ones published in the 60s or 70s. So I don't know how many of them read Nancy Drew um, or what exactly the, the books are that got them through. I mean, mm -hmm. when I teach children's literature, I ask them to write about the history of themselves as readers or to write about um, a book that meant a lot to them. And many of them had parents whose lives were so busy that they weren't read to by their parents mm -hmm. in the same way that I, th I know I was. So it's, a, it's interesting. I don't, they might need a Nancy Drew. I don't know if they have one or who substitutes. Mm -hmm. Now your mother had a profound impact mm -hmm. on you and not only helped you develop a love of reading but also sort of nurtured the idea that literature gives you options and it gives you choices, mm -hmm. power. Would you tell us a little bit about your mother and what she helped sure. you Sure. I mean, it's funny because <laughs> I think it backfired actually she wanted me to go to law or business school. But what she did was she had not been able to go to college. She had to end her education in high school because of the depression. And but she's a very intelligent and passionate woman, and she really wanted her children to go to college. I mean, it was drummed into my head that I would go to college, so that when I was a senior in college, I felt like I was falling off the edge of the world. I was however old you are, and I'd done everything I was supposed to. I didn't quite know what to do next. But one of her ways of, of you know, showing us the importance of education and reading was to read to us. She always let us go take a lot of books out of the library, and. We read a lot, and she had a big green volume of poetry called The Treasury of the Familiar. Mm -hmm. It had all kinds of poems in it, from snippets of Shakespeare to ballads like Frankie and Johnny and corny poems. But she read to us from that all the time, and I really think that's where I got my love of poetry, was from her reading um, to us from that book of poems. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that she wanted you to be a lawyer <laughs> and y you became a poet because in many ways they use language 
I wouldn't say exactly the same way, but they both understand the power of language mm -hmm. and the importance of a compelling argument. Right. How did you come to realize that poetry was a central part of your life, or should be? Well, you know, it, it's funny at first that you say that because I have several friends who are writers and who are lawyers. So I was somehow thinking about that driving here, how um, the use of language and the examination of language, both professions have that in, in common. But I think it was just that I always loved to write, and I think it's from my mother reading to me. And I somehow had the sense that it wasn't, I went to a very kind of strict Catholic pub at school when I was young, and I knew that to tell the nuns you wanted to be a poet wouldn't be really cool, mm -hmm. but that women could be teachers or, do or nurses, not doctors then. So I always said I wanted to be a teacher and never told anybody I wanted to be a writer, but that's what I wanted to be. And um, so I did become a teacher, <laughs> oddly enough, <laughs> but I think it was yeah. when I was in college, it suddenly became, and they had creative writing courses and you had writers as your teachers, it became a more legitimate thing to do. And I don't know if that would have been different for me had I been a man hmm. or had I been from a different kind of background um, with you new writers. Mm -hmm. But um, there was the compromise, I think, with my family, you, uh, my mother wanting us to certainly get a, a profession that we could you know, earn our living by and take care of ourselves with. Mm. How did you decide that poetry was the genre for you mm -hmm. as opposed to fiction? You know, I don't ever remember making conscious choice. I think I always loved the music of poetry and the sound of the words in your mouth when you were writing a poem. Mm. And I do remember once I was about eight years old and we lived in Sicily and we didn't have a lot of books in English and I'd read every one I had three times, so I mm. decided I would try to write a novel. And I just didn't know how to do it. I, you know, I did everything in real time. She got off the mm. chair, she walked, you know, she turned the doorknob. It was terrible. Mm. But I somehow knew that poetry uh, didn't have to be real in that way. I loved the music. I loved the images. So I think my attraction to poetry was initially very intuitive. Mm. Now you made a great comment. You actually made several great comments. One that really struck me was about how your sense of the poet's role mm -hmm. has changed over time. And you said, when I first started writing poetry, I think I had more of an art for art's sake approach. Although I still believe a poem is primarily responsible to its own form and impulse, I see the role of the poet in a larger way. Poets need to be keepers of language, especially in a time when words are so often used to distort and manipulate. Mm. What does that mean to be a keeper of language, especially these days when people turn on the news or look at a newspaper yeah. and every day there is a dire prediction about what's coming. What does the keeper of language do? Well, you know, I think of words as being the writers and in particular the poets tools. And just like any good, you know, craftsperson or, or work person would take good care of their tools, I think we need to take in our own writing good care of language and sort of model that in terms of the precise meaning of words and and um, you know, I wish I could think of an example offhand, but we're all aware of the sort of euphemisms with which we talk about war. Even the word troops, maybe that's common, but I, you know, they'll say so many troops killed. I always thought troops referred to a large number of men in a whatever, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I feel like there are a lot of um, euphemisms and that poets and writers have to w work against that. They have to keep words honest and use them very precisely. and hold other people accountable for that as well. Um, I don't know if I can be any more precise than that. Maybe mm. I think the Orwell's notion, you know, politics in the English language, he's not talking about poetry, but he is talking about the way that sloppy language and sloppy, sloppy thinking, you know, sort of abet and enlarge each other. And so I think one of the poet's duties is to think clearly in precise language. Mm. It almost sounds as though if the language gets sloppy, the thinking gets sloppy, and therefore you can lose the truth, yeah. which is the real danger. Right. And, and I also think that the language of the emotion is something that comes through in poetry, the language of the spirit, because so much of it is metaphorical or, or works with images, and that ability of language to sort of connect you with something 
larger than yourself, I think is really key and can't happen if we, you know, use words haphazardly. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were <clears throat> teaching in a college classroom, mm -hmm. How do you get students to see themselves in the literature you're introducing them to? Mm -hmm. How do you bridge the gap between Nancy Drew <laughs> and unrealistic expectations and needing to have very precise language? How do you help someone on that journey? Well, I, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure how. I know, for example, the precise language we were, I was talking about a poem in class. Um, it was Akhmadova Sank, and the students had been, it's a tough poem for them because it really focuses on images, and um, there was one part where she said we were wrenched from the earth, and they understood that they were, the lovers were like stars in heaven, but I asked them about that word wrenched and, and what kind of emotion it was, and they were able to say that, well, it's a violent motion, it's mm -hmm. a breaking motion, and I think making them pay attention. Poems are great because they tend, they're not always to be short, and so you can concentrate somebody's attention on a couple of words. So that's the sort of precision part of it. Um, the sort of more human connection part of it, I think I, I you know, I, there's lots of tricks of the trade. Um, ask them to write a letter to the character. Ask them what they would do if they were the character. Ask them, you know, to write about it from a different point of view. I, my students at Pine Manor and also in Changing Lives tend to react, they, they're not trying to impress me with all their big ideas. They tend to react at a very kind of gut human level to what's ever going on. And I really prize that. Mm -hmm. um, with for you know in them and I think they make that part of my job pretty easy. Mm. What are some of the ideas or values that you hope your students in both mm. places will take away from literature? Well I think empathy is mm -hmm. an important one. Um, I know I liked to read because I could find out what it was like to be someone whose life was entirely different than mine, took place in another part of the world and in another century. And I, th and I think empathy is really important, to be able to empathize with someone whose life is very different than yours. Mm. And I also think, and this is particularly true in the Changing Lives program, when we talk about the kinds of choices a character has made and why did he or she make those choices and what would the alternatives be, that you're able to cultivate a kind of moral imagination. Um, and that, that somehow ties back to yourself and helps you feel like, okay, I make choices, I'm responsible for choices, I can be thoughtful about these, these choices. So I think poetry and, and literature in general has, provides the opportunity to expand your worldview and expand your knowledge of character and also expand your sense of yourself and your own accountability. Mm. Does, that's a big claim. <laughs> I don't know if we do it, but we try. Oh, I'm sure you do, yeah. because when I was volunteering at the women's prison, mm. I saw the very same thing. Another thing that happened quite often was after people did develop sort of that moral imagination, they also started to view themselves differently, yeah. and that was very powerful to witness. Would you tell us a little bit about some of the transformations you've seen? Sure. I mean, um, I've seen them both in my Pine Manor students and in the Changing Lives. Changing Lives is 10 weeks, so whatever you know, uh, changes you're going to see will happen very quickly. But one thing is the women will come in and they'll always begin their response to the story by saying, this is probably wrong, but, mm -hmm. or I know this is stupid, but. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we thought the probation officer and I who work together I say, no, no. And by the end, they've stopped prefacing their every remark. Mm -hmm. with that. Um, they get a little bit more confidence in what they're saying. And with women, you know, I, I sometimes where this is going to perpetuate a stereotype, but you can see that in their appearance. They come into class one day and they've fixed up their hair or they've dressed more carefully. They're looking you in the eye. They're just, you know. So I've seen there was one young woman who didn't really want to be in the program at all and didn't talk to us. And 
she eventually, I mean, not because of anything we did, but because of her own determination, um, took part in the class, became quite a leader, uh, got her GED, <coughs> excuse me, starting at a community college. And this was a young woman who came in filled with anger. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's also, uh, teaching literature provides you with a space to have a kind of conversation, whether it's in the college classroom or in Changing Lives, which some people don't have an opportunity to have. I think you and I probably talk about things we've read and things going on in our lives to the degree that it kind of surprises me that other people don't have this. But it's a real powerful conversation, and I think that conversation can be transforming in from small ways to, to large ways. Mm. Now, in an email exchange that we yeah. had, you described that as a democratic oh, conversation. Yeah where everybody's opinion matters and is valuable. For a lot of people, that's sort of a startling experience. Yeah. Why do you think so many women have that hesitancy? Because you see that in many college classes. Well, I'm not sure this is mm -hmm. right, but, or they may not actually say those words, but their tone of voice or body language says that for mm -hmm. them. Why is it so liberating for us to have a conversation and to give ourselves permission to do that? I know that's really interesting, and the term democratic conversation comes out of the, the sort of the changing lives um, description, and they do it both in men's group and women's with women's groups. But I think in changing lives, you're. I were in my class with the probation officer. Some classes are run with the facilitator, usually college professor, the probation officer, and the judge. So to be on equal footing with the judge is really quite mm -hmm. amazing. And to think that people are going to listen to you and hear what you have to say. Um, and I think that, you know, I have the privilege of teaching at a women's college. I don't have any men in the classroom. And I know I've taught at co-ed colleges before, and that the men sometimes do tend to dominate, not always, you know, and I have several very outspoken young women, and, and even when you have a group of women, there'll be one woman who's really, one, a couple who are really dominant, but I don't know what it is, except we're taught, perhaps, to defer, we're taught that a kind of assertiveness isn't attractive in a woman, um, we're taught to take care of other people and so to sort of soft pedal ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, again, those are sort of really sweeping generalizations. I'm sure that's not true across the board, but, um, but I think it is more characteristic of women and that having a conversation w with just women where you can be listened to and heard um, really makes you rethink that and rethink your own value and also think about the way you present yourself. What is there in this tentativeness? And how much is it a protection for me as well as something that I'd like to shake off? Mm, good point. How does poetry, reading it or writing it, help people shake that off? How does it liberate them, especially if they have grown up in a family or an area where women are still expected to be silent. Well, one thing I think for me is <laughs> that I think is tremendously liberating and fun is to use the persona poem. So, you know, fiction writers, I guess, do this all the time, but you get to um, inhabit someone very different than you and create a different voice and try on different personalities. And I think uh, it's funny because mostly I write poetry. I contributed a, an essay to a book called Why I'm Still Married. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of a subtitle. Women talk about, I don't know, love, sex, and who does the dishes. And that was a personal essay, and I found it much more difficult to read from when mm -hmm. I had to give a reading with the group to publicize the book, because my poems are as a distance. They're really not me. Um, they're aspects of me, and some of the things might have been what happened to me, but they're really carefully crafted and they feel distant. Mm -hmm. For this felt much more scary and raw and I felt much more revealed. And a friend of mine who writes nonfiction said, don't worry, after a while you won't feel that way. And it's true, after a while I didn't. But I think poetry or fiction gives you a kind of distance, which is really, you can let, you can say some things you probably wouldn't say as yourself. Mm. If there was only one idea that you could convey to your students, what would it be? That's a good question. Um, what would it be? I, th 
think to, to be passionate, you know, to take some risks and be, and be passionate. And that's not an idea about language or even about teaching um, per se, but I think in a sense it's what all of us, at least at Pine Manor, want to do, empower these young women um, to make something of their lives that they want to make. Um, to be their own, the own creators of their own lives. And of course, when you do that, you, re you risk failure. You know, maybe you're not going to be able to buy the Gucci bag <laughs> or you won't have this apartment or, you know, but to risk failure is a really important thing. And I guess that's what I would like to, you know, if that's a value that I could impart to, to students and people that I teach, I think that would be it. You know, be passionate, take risks. Well, you have certainly empowered many people <laughs> with your poems. Would you read another poem for us? Yes. Um, this is another poem from the Nancy Drew series, but it's a little bit different. Um, the Nancy Drew poems run the gamut from, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a little more water, poems that are clearly about the character Nancy to poems that are about, um, about me or my life but somehow have a sleuthiness. <laughs> I guess if Stephen Colbert can say truthiness, yeah. I can say sleuthiness in them. <laughs> and this poem is called Jewel Box, and I tried to write it for a long, long time and couldn't do it successfully, and somehow the Nancy Drew work freaked me out to do it. Jewel Box. Each morning when my mother dumped her jewelry on the bed, I'd help her sort it into piles. Daughters, daughter-in-law, granddaughters, each with her hoard of sparkle and shine. Take it home with you, she'd tell me. I won't wear it again. But not that, and not that ring your father gave me when he left for sea, not yet. And piece by piece, she'd restore her wealth, her history. At night, restless, she jumbled the piles, and each morning we'd start over. Some days I went for value, the cocktail ring with its 52 diamonds spiraling. The next, I'd opt for sentiment, her charm bracelet, each figure holding a story I remembered from childhood. We have to do this now, she whispered. Anyone could come in here when I'm gone. Like who, I began to ask, but the word gone hung between us, a clue so terrible and bright, we both turned away. Oh, that's wonderful, Kathleen. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.